I promise that Rick and I don't talk about the upcoming sermons, but time and time again, he kind of sets the stage for me, so thank you, Rick. (laughs) When we come to church, it's very important that we learn. Um, You know, Jesus was a teacher, and while preaching can make you feel good for the moment, and I can certainly do that, when God tells me to do it, it's teaching that's going to carry you through the difficult times. You've got to have some knowledge. In the Bible, it talked about people would sit with itching ears, and what that meant is they wanted to come in, see the program, get entertained, little hoop and a holler and go, man, that was good. And that's okay as long as they bear the fruit. But I don't know about you, I've looked at a lot of different preachers growing up in my life, and while they could put on a show, the private life didn't match the life behind the platform. God's looking for pastors and leaders that they both match up. And I'm glad to say there are a lot that are matching up, but there's some that just haven't got on board yet. When they get on board, when we all get of one mind and one accord, that's when the world will change. I'm going to talk a little bit about a fellow by the name of Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, his gift, when God would talk to him, it would be through visions. He would give him Uh, dreams that were so real that he could have swore it truly happened. He would take him places, and then Ezekiel was the mouthpiece for God, and he would talk to the people and tell them what was going to be coming upon the world or what they needed to change or what God was going to be doing. But when you read your Bible, it's very important to know that it's not all literal, There's symbols in here as well. If we would read this literally, like for instance, when Jesus said, those that drink of me will never thirst again, ew, if you're taking that literally, ew. In fact, some disciples, when he said that people would have to eat of his body, they actually left his group thinking, this guy's lost it. He was good up until this point, but now he's wanting us to eat his body. Well, they were taking things literally, and Jesus was talking symbolically. So when you read your Bible, you need to ask for wisdom to understand how it is that he's speaking. Is he speaking with symbols? Is he speaking with numbers? Is he speaking literally? So many people got into debates because uh, God used the term day because we understood day. So when he talked about how he created the world, we had church people that were made to look like fools by the scientists because they said, no, that's a literal 24-hour day. Well, in the Bible, if you know your Bible, God even says that a day to him is like a thousand years. See, he was just doing a time frame showing a sequence of things to be. And so when Ezekiel talks about what he saw, he's talking symbolically here. My scripture is about water. You might think, well, that's kind of odd to preach about water. But water, I'm not talking about just the literal water. I'm talking about the water that the Bible talks of. And any time that the Bible talks about water, that has to do with life and the Holy Spirit. We know that our physical body can only last so long without water. And when we start getting dehydrated, we have symptoms. Thirst is the first one, but by the time that you start getting thirsty, your body's already started to lose some water. And it's saying we need to do something about this. We need to replenish. If people get headaches when they come in for a massage, if they get headaches a lot, I will ask them where their headaches are. And if they point right here to the forehead, I say, well, you're dehydrated. Because what happens is if you don't get the water in you when your body needs it, then it starts pulling from the muscles. Then your muscles get tight. So many people that are slightly dehydrated when their muscles and their joints are stiff, if they would just drink water, that stiffness would go away. It's you're not getting the lubrication that you need. And if you don't jump in and do something then, then what happens is it starts taking from the organs. 
Your brain is over 70% water, so that's why you get a little foggy in your thinking, a little hallucination sometimes because it's, it's sapping the water from your brain. Then if you don't get to that, then it starts taking it from the organs, and if you get so dehydrated, dehydrated there's a time that it doesn't matter what they do, they can't save you. So that's what happens to us physically. And so God knew how important water was because water is the essence of life. Nothing can live without water. So he carries us over to the spiritual side. And right now, whether we want to admit it or not, the world is in a drought, spiritually. We are in a, a drought and we're experiencing the symptoms of it. And unless the world turns to God, collapse is certain. But church is the key. Amen. This truly can be the most exciting time for you to be alive. When we are born, we are created beings and God puts two desires in our heart. One of those is to worship so that we will find our way back to him. The other desire that everyone has is they want to make a difference. They want to know that their life here mattered. They don't want to just pass away thinking, I didn't do anything, I didn't make a difference anywhere. Well, I want to give you good news. Living in this time, what you do can make the greatest difference. What we do in here affects what is done out there. Amen. See, God's not so concerned about what's going on in the White House. He's concerned about what's going on in his house. Amen. And if he gets what's going on in his house correct, then the White House is going to take care of itself. But church is the key to God's presence on earth. How cool is that? You are part of this worldwide movement that can influence things and situations of people you will never meet just because you're a follower of Christ yes. and you're willing to go a little bit deeper. Church is the key. What happens in church influences what happens everywhere else. So the sad part about that is the world's in a mess. God's had to shake it up and he's moved his hand back a little bit. Why? It's because the churches have gotten complacent. I can say that because we're in a church. So I look at us first before I can point fingers anywhere else. And I want to tell you that I am very proud this morning when I looked out in the congregation, I didn't see one person asleep. I didn't see one person texting on their phone. I saw them engaged with the worship service. I saw them raising a hand. I saw some standing to their feet. You wanna get God to move? You worship, that's how you move. See, the, the sermon, that's important. That's a critical part of your journey, of your growing, of your understanding what to do. That's not the main part. The main part is worship. And I'm so grateful to the worship team and the band members that they come and they practice so that we can be engaged in this worship. See, they, they lay the table for us and we can come and eat. When your heart is broken, you can come and you can sit and you can listen to the worship music and you can feel God's presence and it can heal your soul. It can heal your spirit. It can lift you up. It can give you hope. In the Bible time, they would put the singers out on the front line because they were going to go set the atmosphere for God's presence. It's all in your worship. Your worship doesn't have to be a song. Your worship can be your attitude. Your worship can be the way that you sit down and read your Bible. The worship can be the songs that you play on the radio. Your worship can be just thanking God for what he's done. But if we want the world to change, it's through worship. It's not through judgment. It's not through roll calls. It's not, tr it's not through baptisms. It's through our worship. Our worship brings God's presence into the house. And if we get God's presence into the house, then it will be so big it will overflow into society. Worship is the key. 
Worship is what's going to get the enemy off your back. Worship is what's going to lift your spirit up when you're, when you're low. Worship is what's going to turn those tears of sadness into tears of joy. Worship is the key. So what I'm going to talk about here is Ezekiel is going to help drive that point home to us. In the Bible times, God in the Old Testament wanted a place to dwell. Now, not that one place could contain him, but he wanted a place to dwell where his presence would be manifest, that people would gather together. And so in the Old Testament, they called it a tabernacle. And even in the wilderness, one of the things that was essential that he told Moses is he said, build me a place. Build me a place to dwell. Until that time, there was a mountain that God would bring his presence down. They called it the mountain of God said, I want a place to dwell. After they finally got settled and they were in a permanent residence, then King David's son, Solomon, built God a temple. And it was a temple beyond all temples. This was a king that built a temple that was made for a king. And God was there. God would show up and his his presence would be manifested. It would be concentrated in this area But then there became a problem. God left the house. He left the building. He left the building because they started worshiping other things. Not just talking about statues, but they started worshiping their material things, their jobs, their careers, the people that they were around, their leisure time. So they become to where they were idolaters, And they became rebellious. And God left the temple. And in the book of Ezekiel, from chapter 40 on, he's talking about the judgment of God and why God left the temple. But the good news is, is in chapter 43 and on, he's talking about how God is going to come back to the temple. At this time that he was writing to the children of Israel, they had now then become captive in Babylon because when God left the temple, chaos. The culture became chaotic. The society, the economy bottomed out. There was calamity everywhere when God left the temple. What happened in the temple affected the world around them. So when God left, the nation was in trouble. So the first half of Ezekiel, he's telling them about all the troubles because of God leaving the temple. God was no longer welcome in the temple. They had their programs. They had their way that it should run. And God didn't feel welcome. He didn't feel like he had the right to move the way that he wanted to move. So he left. If you're in somebody's house and you're not feeling welcome, you leave. (laughs) And unless things change, you never come back again. And that's what God did. And the sad thing is, is that's what God has done in a lot of the churches. Oh, the building's still there. And we can still have the programs and we can still sing the songs. And we can still get our series and we can still preach. And it can still sound like an okay sermon. But there's no living water in there. It's just a program. It's just a bunch of people running through the motions. It's what they call a dead church. Oh, the flesh might look like things are going on, but what's the fruits? See, if there's not any kindness in the church, if there's not any generosity in the church, if there's not any lifting one another up, but we're judging, there's no water in the church. There's no water in the church. There's a drought. That drought's going to affect our world. So we can change this. God wants churches throughout the world, but if there has to just even be one church, then I say, God, we're on board. We will worship. We will worship. We will let your spirit flow here. I may have one thing that I'm going to preach. I pulled into the parking lot, and he's changed it time and time again. I'm like, okay, here we go. I don't know what I'm going to say, but you're wanting me to talk in this area, so that's what we're going to do. God wants to have a place that he feels welcome. So in the Old Testament, he left. 
But then Ezekiel starts talking to them later on how God is going to come back to the temple because the people now have, they have repented. In the New Testament, God has a bunch of houses. He has a church on every single corner. But he's not in a church on every single corner. The churches that he's in is the churches, the houses that are fulfilling his work. The ones that are listening to him and, and doing his work. Those are the places that he calls his home. We are also referred to as the temple of God. It says that our body is a temple unto the Lord. Why? Because once we become saved, and Jesus is our savior, then he dwells within us. But today's message, we're not talking about the individual per se. We're talking about the collective worship group as his house. He wants to live not just with you. He wants to live with us. But far too many people come to church to be entertained and follow a program. Far too many people have used this word, oh, and you've heard it too. Maybe you've said it. If so, I'm sorry. Just not getting fed. Just not getting fed. Well, isn't it strange that one person can say, just not getting fed, and the person right next to them say, every time I come here, I am so fed. I am so grateful. Every time I come out of here, I learn something different. What's the difference there? Bet you one person's more of a worshiper. Bet you one person comes not just to get, but to give. So see, we've got to change that because when you worship, you give. And if we're just in the atmosphere of give, 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 we've missed the boat. Because God's not gonna give, give, give his presence and it fall down if you're not giving to him. See, worship opens up the door for his presence to come and engulf you. So you're not getting fed. I'm going to ask you, how are, how's your worship life? Not your prayer life. How's your worship life? Do you wake up in the morning thanking him because you opened your eyes? Do you wake up and thank him because you can get up and go somewhere? Do you thank him because you got food in your belly? Do you thank him because you didn't get that phone call in the middle of the night that broke your heart? Do you thank him because you got safe and you weren't at that place when that terrorist shot people? What is your worship like? If you get your worship filled to overflowing, God's presence is going to fill and overflow you. And it doesn't matter where you sit, you will feel fed because you're coming to give, not get. Now, don't get me wrong. You need to receive something. You need to receive some intelligence. You need to receive some education in your Bible. You need to have something to work on throughout the, your week to make more of a success. But if you just come for fluff, if you just come because we want to jump a pew and sh shout and holler, that's not going to carry you through. You've got to have some substance there. You can't just eat cotton candy all day long because that's your favorite and that makes you feel good for the moment. You've got to have some meat in your belly to carry you through. And that meat in your belly is through your worship. You're pushing in towards God. You're learning and growing. Is it work? Yes, it's work. But it's work that pays off. It's work that gives you a promotion. It's work that gives you a bonus. So that's what Ezekiel's talking about here. He's talking about how God is going to come back to the house. The purpose of God's house is for us to experience him. How life is on the outside is a result of things that's on the inside of the church. I don't know about you, but um, psychology and any kind of theory, whether it's color theory, number theory, that just excites me, it interests me. And you can tell a lot about a person Oh, us ladies aren't going to like this, but it's true. You can tell a lot about a person by their house. If their house is a mess and they're content in that mess, I guarantee you inside in here is a mess. It reflects on the outside. 
When in times of my life when things were spinning out of control and I had no control to change it on the outside, I would, what they call, I would declutter. I would go through my house, and my house was never really messy, but I would go through the closets and I would throw out stuff because I had control over that. And when that drawer looked organized, I felt a little calmer in here. So on a grander scale, what happens in the church, if you're comfortable in the mess, if you're comfortable in the nitpicking, if you're comfortable in the judging and the skepticism and the gossip, then that's what you're going to have on the outside. What you have on the inside is what's going to be on the outside. So the great thing is, is you are world changers. I don't have to have a mega church to change the world. Gideon had 300 people. He started with 32,000. God said, get an army, but the problem was the 32,000, Gideon built that army. God said, you give me 300, I now let me build the army. So we don't have to have a mega church to change the world. I just have to have bodies that are willing to worship, to bring God's presence down, to let it change their life, to let it flow out through them and out into the world. That's how we change what's going on in the world. Not by our committees, not by our protest. While that might help temporary, it's not a permanent fix. It's time for the churches to wake up. God moved his hand back because the churches had gotten complacent. They got too comfortable. They, they wanted their way instead of God's way but God's coming back to the churches. And that makes me very happy. And he made me come to the book of Ezekiel to show just how he's going to come back to the church. If God can get his glory in this house, he can get his glory in every house. We should come ready to experience him and to worship God. The purpose of church is for God's presence to be manifested and to change his people, Amen. and then to overflow in the culture. So in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel finds himself, an, an angel has brought him to the temple, to the temple that God had left. But he said, God's coming back. And what the angel did is the angel took him into the sanctuary. And when he took him into the sanctuary, some water started to flow. And that water started to flow and it got up to his ankles. And that water represented life coming back into the temple. That water represented the Holy Spirit moving in his life. That, that water represented the Spirit of God. But it didn't just stop there. See, there was a little bit that he could work with. So you get into a church and you feel a little bit of the Spirit moving, you can work with that church. You can step in and you can get more of God's Spirit moving in you and on you, but you've got to have something to work with. You don't want to go to a dry church. You, when you walk into a church, you need to be able to feel God's presence in that church. If you feel yuck in your belly and that's not for you, don't go there. You're not going to have living water. You'll experience a spiritual drought. But if you start feeling a little bit of Spirit in that church, it's, it's just up to your ankles. You've got something to work with. And that's what happened with Ezekiel. He's walking into the temple, and it's just up to his ankles. But it says that the angel led him. Oh. So he didn't stand in one place, and it started moving up. He had to go a little bit deeper into the sanctuary. He had to go a little bit deeper into his worship, into his prayer life. He couldn't just stand still and have God overpower him. God was wanting to bring him in a little bit deeper. And so as he walked through the sanctuary, then it wasn't at his ankles anymore. Then the water was up to his knees. But it didn't stop there. Then Ezekiel said that as he continued to walk further into the sanctuary, it got up to his waist. Now he can still walk because it was at his ankles. He can still wade through it for it's at his knees. He can still get through it when it's at his waist. But then, it doesn't stop there. Because see, when God is wanting his presence to abound, he's going to overflow you. He's the God of 
more than enough. The further we go, the deeper it gets, the more he experiences. So the more deeper you go with God, the more you're going to experience. There's not a limit on how deep you can go with God, except for the limit that you put on yourself. Isn't that cool? I don't know about you, but I want more of God. I may have plenty where I am, but I want more than enough. I want him to, to overflow me with his presence, but that's up to me. That's not up to the preacher. That's not up to the worship team. That's up to me. So the only thing that's limiting that is me. That's good news. I don't have to depend on you. I don't have to depend on my brother, my sister, a boss. I get to decide. I get to decide how deep I go with my creator. I get to decide what kind of difference I can make on the outside by making a difference here on the inside. I get to do that. You get to do that. You're world changers. You're not just world participators. You can be world changers. But it's in your worship. And it's how deep will you go for your heavenly father. So now it says that he's going just a little bit deeper. But it doesn't stop there. Then he says that he starts to see where the water is flowing. Now it's not just flowing in the sanctuary. <laughs> it's starting to flow out of the sanctuary. He said, it was a river that I began to see that I couldn't cross. He had to swim. This river was over his head. God was showing how this was in the sanctuary and now it's starting to flow out underneath the sanctuary. So what happens in the church is going to affect what's happening on the outside. And here's what's cool about this. It says that it started to flow so much that it, he had to swim, and it couldn't be crossed. And he said to me, son of man, have you seen this? In other words, the angel is excited. He's like, look is what is happening here. Because you didn't stop way back when it was ankle deep and went, oh, that's good enough for me. I'm happy. I got what I need. God knows what I need. I'm good. Yeah, you could walk around just getting your toes wet, but your buddy is all in and swimming. And he says, have you seen this? He said, then he brought him to the bank of the river. Now he's got him outside of the sanctuary because the water is flowing so much. And he said, the water flows towards the eastern region and it goes down to the valley and it enters the sea. When it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. What sea are we talking about? We're talking about the Dead Sea. We're talking about the Dead Sea that's at the lowest point on earth. But because there was worship in the sanctuary and God's presence was there, it not only healed what was in the sanctuary, it flowed down into the sea and it says that it healed the water so that every living thing that moves, wherever that river goes, will live. Ezekiel's all about this bringing back to life. He's the same one that talked to those dry bones and they lived again. What God's saying is if I can get my church, if I can get my church to come alive in me, if I can get my church to let my presence dwell, if I can find a church that I'm welcome in, I'll heal what's out there. I'll take what used to be dead in me and I'll bring it back to life. Why? Because of the, there was a, some people in the church that said we will worship. We will go a little bit deeper. And he said there was a great multitude of fish because these waters go everywhere for they were healed and everything will live wherever the river goes. What is so cool is then it says it doesn't even just stop there. He says, then along the bank of the river, I saw kind, all kinds of trees that were used for food and the fruit that they will bear every month because the water flows from, he didn't say the river, the sanctuary. And he said their food, fruit will be for food and their leaves for medicine. You want to heal the world? Heal the church. Invest in your church. So many people will say, well, you know, the Bible says what's going to happen is going to happen. And yes, it is. But he didn't give a time frame on it. 
Wouldn't you like to be out of here before the evil stuff that's supposed to happen happens? I would. And so while I'm here, I want a little bit of that heaven to come down here on earth. I want to extend this thing. Why do I want to extend it? Because I want to save as many souls as we can. It's kind of selfish when people say, well, I wish Jesus would come. I don't. Why don't I? Because the churches aren't packed yet. I want more souls to go to heaven with me. If you have never experienced the over your head, overwhelming presence of God, ask yourself why. Why? It's available, it's out there. I want it. I know that you want it. See, our culture died, and our society died, and our morality died, because there wasn't any water in the churches. They're thirsty, and they're looking for something to quench their thirst, and they haven't found what they need yet, because the church doesn't have the water to offer it. If you are dehydrated, and have you ever been to the place where you're thirsty and you're drinking stuff, but you're like, man, I'm still thirsty. But it's maybe because you've grabbed a pop or a juice or a tea or something like that, and you're like, but I'm still thirsty. It's because water is really truly the only thing that will quench your thirst. So you can try all the other stuff, but it's not what your body is needing. And it's a sad thing that the church hasn't gone out with their prayers and their examples of the way they live to make the people thirsty for what we have. You're not gonna get it to them by preaching to them and preaching down to them. You're gonna get it to them by feeling refreshed, shining your light. Because it says, if you'll notice, that it says that the, the fruit had to be on the tree. The trees had to bear the fruit. You'll know who they are by their fruit. I don't care if they can quote the scripture and know the Bible in and out. I don't care if they say they fast five days a week. I don't care if they know every single preacher and go to every convention. If they're mean and they're judgmental and they're angry, they're not bearing fruit. I'm gonna go to that fruit tree and I'm still gonna walk away starved because it looked like it should be a fruit tree. And it looked like a peach. That's one of my favorite fruits. But it was rotten. It looked like it on the outside. I couldn't tell the difference between that rotten peach and the other one that was good and supple inside because they looked the same. But it didn't satisfy me. So when we can get people that are bearing the fruit, we're not going to have to worry about what's going on out there. It's going to start changing. People are going to start loving one another again. Why? Because God's presence is flowing through us. And then it also said, and their leaves will be for medicine. You will help heal the brokenhearted. You will help the mama that doesn't know where to turn. You'll give her hope. Why? Because you've been with your heavenly father. That's what God is looking for. He, the goal of the church is that the believers and the disciples of Christ should influence the world around us. God's looking for a church. If he, he can find a people who will worship and be led, then the evil that's on the outside, it won't prevail. I want more. Do you? We can have it. And I'm so grateful because tonight we're going to have a baptism service. And you know, when you put the water in the baptismal, it's different than when you put it in your aquarium or your sink. It means something different. And God wanted me to talk about the living water this morning because he knew that tonight that water is going to be living there. It's going to symbolize a new birth. It's going to symbolize a washing away. So while we have a baptism tonight, let's not just look at it as symbolically for that person. How about let's look at that for the world? How about, God, we want you to, to wash over us, 
to wash us clean so that we can then help to wash the world clean from its sins. Yeah, bad things are going to happen. But if you're not dehydrated and you're not in a spiritual drought, you could be the one to help change it around. And I'm so grateful, I've said it time and time again, but in closing, I'm so grateful to be with this group of people. Because when I look at you, I do look at a world changer. I don't look at your mistakes from yesterday and your past. I look at somebody that's on the road to success because you have a willing heart and you have a willing mind and you're strong. Renee is gonna close with, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Why don't we soak it up this morning? It'd be nourishment for your soul. It'd be good for your bones. It'd bring peace to your heart. If your heart's broken this morning, let the rain of his presence fall over you and heal the heart. Let the rain of his presence not just fall here, but let the rain of his presence, maybe we can intercede and let it water the world out there. The world's in a hurting place. It's dry, it's a spiritual drought and they're thirsty. They're thirsting for something and they haven't found it yet. They tried the bottle, they tried the drugs, they tried the, the anger because they couldn't take the hatred in their heart anymore. They're thirsty. So instead of us judging out there when they're doing the crazy stuff, it really should break our heart because something's driving them and they don't know where to go to get refreshed. They're looking for the president to fix it. They're looking for the Congress to fix it. They're looking for the TV stations to fix it, and it's not there. Church is the key. Let's be the church. Not just here, but let's be the church out there so that he can flow through us and so that we'll have to swim. We can't just walk anymore. We have to swim, and it overflows. This is an exciting time to live. So as she sings, just let it fall on you. Let it wash away the dust, the grime from the week. If the heart's been, the heart's been a little bit hardened, let that water soften it. If you've been set in your ways, maybe let it wash the dirt off your feet so that you can start a new path. Ask God to let his presence rain on you so that you have more than enough to rain on somebody else. God bless you.